Well, we know opening day is an annual holiday in Detroit, but throughout the great state of Michigan, the NFL draft is just as big. Why? Well, because everybody look forward to see what the Lions will do to improve their football team. And it happens Thursday night, 8 o'clock, a virtual edition this year, the 85th annual NFL draft. And to talk about it, we've got the what will be the 16th year play-by-play voice of Detroit Lions football and Dan Miller, Pro Bowlers, TJ Lang, Chris Spielman, and Herman Moore. Fellas, thanks for the time. We appreciate it. Hope you and yours are doing well. Dan, let me ask you this first. What do you like about where the Lions positioning is? What they have coming up in the draft, nine picks, uh, including four in the top 85? Well, you know, Shep, I think starting at the top, sitting at number three, you like the fact that you can look at it and say, right off the bat, if they stay there, they know they're going to get a good player. They can narrow the pool down because there's only two teams picking in front of them. And then if they decide to trade back, as Bob Quinn talked about last week, they can narrow the pool down to the number of players that they're comfortable with if they trade back. In other words, if they said there's six guys we like on this board, we know we can trade back to number six. So I think it puts them in control of finding that first player that kind of sets the tone for your draft, that allows you to understand the kind of talent that you're going to get. And it puts you in control of whether you want to stay at three, trade back, how far you trade back. So uh, it really defines their options for them. I think at the top, that's that's significant. And then, as you mentioned, look, nine picks, two in the third round. This is a draft that's got some depth of positions that they can certainly use. So I think there's a lot to like about how this sets up for them going forward on Thursday. Well, I think you can address an immediate need. I was listening to uh, Bob Quinn when he talked about this. This is a draft, especially at number th- uh, three, where you have to find an immediate impact starter. And so, obviously, when you finish last in pass defense, I believe they rank 32nd, and you play as much man as philosophically they like to play, then you have to look at corner. But somebody on the defensive side that is specifically suited, whether that be a pass rusher if Chase Young happens to drop the three, or the consensus is, at least from what I've read and from my own evaluation, I think Jeff Okuda is probably the safest pick and the smartest pick. And I think you'll see throughout this whole draft, not only by the Lions, Shep, but by all teams, that uh, they're going to take the safest pick possible. And for me, Jeff Okuda would be the safest pick possible. Plus, it feels philosophically what you want to do when you have a lockdown man-to-man corner. So what should their philosophy be? TJ, you first, and then I'll get him in the What should the philosophy be, I think the philosophy this year has to be get as many guys that you possibly can that can come in and help you win starting this year. And I think you, you're at a great spot sitting number three, whether you want to take a guy like Jeff Okuda, like Chris said, or you want to take a guy like Isaiah Simmons that can help both your secondary and your front seven. Um, I think those two guys uh, outside of maybe Chase Young and Joe Burrow, who might look like they're going to go one and two, I think those guys, those two guys at Simmons and Okuda might give you the best shot. Um to find an impact guy from day one. And, and I think it's, you know, once you get in the middle rounds, um, genu- um, you know, generally you try to find guys who might be developmental players, maybe high ceiling guys. We can take a chance on, on maybe an offensive lineman or defensive lineman um, and develop him. But I think this year might be, well, let's look for somebody that can be an impact guy. If somebody starts sliding down the chart or somebody we've got ranked really high ends up being there in the third, fourth round, let's take a chance and see if he can come help us uh, win right now. Herman, how would you look at this draft if you were Bob Quinn? Well, I definitely believe that there's – you have to address the defensive side of the ball. I think that's concerning for me more so than than most areas. Uh, I think if you can find some impact players day one, that's going to make a difference, uh, whether you are looking at Kuda or whether you're, you're even looking at um, hopefully someone like Simmons. You know, they they, they may be there. You, you're not – you know, it's not, it's not exactly uh, – a science there that you can get when it comes to the NFL draft players have to be able to come in draft ready. I think a lot of the players now are in that position. You know, we've seen the, the training regimen and everything that takes place. I think it mirrors and it mimics what you get on the NFL level. So the players come in, I think a little bit more ready. If you can get it right, right out of the, go- the gate. Uh, I know a lot of people are asking whether or not they should, they should draft back uh, and, and give up that third uh, pick in the first round. But I, I think right now, if you can get an impact player and you got someone that you know is going to be that day one starter, then that's where you go. Chris, do you go or best player, or how do you combine the two in your mind? 
Well, I'm, I'm a big best player guy, but I think the best player at that position, uh, and especially when you're, uh, I'm assuming he was talking about number three, I think that's where you have to, you can fill both those needs, right? So need and, and best player. Three, that can be the case. Here, here's the other, uh, other thing that I think you want to look at too. So we always look at the depth of the draft, right? What positions are strong? And so if you look at mock drafts and you talk to folks, I think I saw one mock draft where there's probably, and this is good news for guys like TJ, there's, there's six, I think, six offensive tackles projected to go in the first round. Zero running back. So, you know, look for teams, especially when you get down into the uh, – Shep, when you get down in the middle of the first round, everybody's going to try to keep moving back because there's depth at corner, there's depth at receiver, and there's depth at, at offensive linemen. There's a lot of good offensive linemen uh, that are going to be available. But for, for the Lions, look, it, it's, it's all about defense, man. The defense has to get better. If they don't get better – it's done. And so we know the free agent moves that were made. Uh, the Lions proved to be very patriotic because they went out and got their Patriots. That seemed to fit. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'll be here all week. Very good. <laughs> they, yeah, they got, they got their fits for they what, what they want to do. But I think uh, any time that uh, it's, it's all about, and, and Quinn made a great point when he was talking about the late, and TJ was hitting on this a little bit, the, they're going to miss out on OTAs this year. We're all aware of that. So that's when your undrafted free agents or your fifth, sixth, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round guys, that's where they can get evaluated and get noticed and maybe sneak into a lineup or, or prove themselves where they'll be capable. Right now, uh, the Lions and, and no team has that luxury. That's why I was talking about the safest picks. But I do think if you need receiver, and Herman maybe has looked at this, there's a ton of receivers out there. Uh, besides C.D. Lamb and, and, and Judy. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of guys out there, or Jefferson, there's a ton of guys out there that can, can be impact players. But that's what these guys get paid a lot of money for. You have to identify that. How does that guy fit into your scheme? And he is, is he athletically what we're looking for? And mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the job. And so I'm, I'm all about getting the best player available. Uh, and in this case, picking three, it's hard not to get the best player available on your board that will also fill a need. Do you think it's difficult to kind of marry that philosophy, best player and need at the same time? No, I don't. I, I think it's, hey, <laughs> if the best player you've got is, uh, you know, a quarterback, you know, do we really need a quarterback? I don't know. Whether you, it's kind of a fine fine line you have to balance. Yeah. Um, and I love what Chris said. Chris said, you gotta you got to think of guys, these rookies that are going to be coming in this year, they're going to be thrown right into training camp. Uh, if training camp even starts on time, they're going to be thrown into training camp and have three weeks to show the, the team what they can do. Mm -hmm. So I think the better skill guys you can get, the, the guys that are ready to, to contribute from day one, I think those guys give you the best shot of contributing. So um, number three, like Chris, I mean, trying not to repeat everything Chris said, but you have a great spot to fill not only best player available, but also fill the biggest need possible with the best player possible. Yeah, I think one thing that Chris said, too, that's interesting, guys, is when he talked about the depth. And, and I think that that's where the possible trade for the Lions comes in. Because you could see a scenario, and it takes two to trade, and that's one thing we have to understand. If a trade doesn't happen, it's not because Bob Quinn didn't try. It's yeah. because nothing made sense or nobody approached them about it uh, with an offer that they wanted. But I think this, you could trade back to five or six with two teams sitting there, Miami and the Chargers that are looking for quarterbacks and still probably get the same guy that you got at three. I think that's the mm -hmm. intriguing thing about this draft. You add an asset. I think the depth that Chris talks about, if you add another pick in the first round or another pick in the second round by trading back, there's depth at wide receiver. There's depth at defensive tackle. There's depth. At, you look some edge guys that could fall to early in the second round. There's running back depth. If you can add another pick in that top 40 by trading back, I think that's when it becomes, you know, really a situation where the Lions could fill some holes on this roster. If they can't trade back, even still, picking at three, as you guys just alluded to, they're going to get a good player. I think first pick in the second round, when they come up in the second round, mm -hmm. there's going to be possibility of running back, wide receiver, defensive tackle, and maybe an edge like, um, you know, uh, Ito Matos, 
Falls or Epinesa Falls yeah. uh, or Interior Guy Falls. I, I, I think they have a great chance with the depth that Chris alluded to to really do some damage early in this draft. Yeah, maybe even a linebacker like Zach Ball out of uh, Wisconsin. Um, her- yeah, the only thing there, Shep, is they, I feel like they've signed so many linebackers. And you're right. If you look at the board and you say, you know what, this guy is rated so high, we need to take him, then that's something. But I feel like they've signed a lot of linebackers. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, we'll see about you know Davis. He might be done after th- this coming season. We don't know. Yep. Herman, when when you talk about the possibility of a quarterback, because that's what you, I mean, we all – have heard Detroit Lions fans talk about Tua Tagovailoa. Give me the argument for and against drafted a Q at three, uh, who's got that history despite being uh, as accomplished as he is. Uh, the concern I always have with the the Lions, and I, I kind of looked at this even years ago, you have to start thinking about, now Matthew Stafford, everyone's kind of more or less put their, uh, more or less all the confidence that it would be there. And Matthew's been just, you look at he's been just a an ironman and he he's a guy that he hasn't gotten injured he's he's been able to be there and be that stable guy that uh, they didn't have to depend on uh having to look at the backup position but now the lines are there this would have been a valuable time you know what it reminded me of is when uh, and and tj remember this when you had aaron Rodgers and then you had a guy like brett Favre. yeah that, you had a you had a gym behind there but after a while when that person gets that that chance they've been in that system long enough and you don't necessarily need to bring in that quarterback right away and need him to start but right now if if he goes down we, we can see how this changes the dynamics of this football team you can put all the skill guys you want around a player but then you got to look at your alignment you got to make sure you got a really stellar defense when you start losing a key quarterback like Matthew Stafford uh, so I, I would definitely be looking to figure out okay how do I continue to fill that gap yeah you can bring in some veteran guys there's some some pre-existing guys in the NFL that uh, you can have as a backup position. The Lions have already made that decision to do that. But I, I think right now when you're looking at the future and you still have to have that right blend of young talent mixed in with that that veteran side of, of the team, it, it has to match up so that it all comes together at the right time. So when I look at the quarterback position, I would definitely at this point be looking. I would have actually been looking a, a year or two ago. But uh, right now I think it's just imperative that they get a, a quarterback. Fellas, I'd love your thoughts on how – Chef, wait, wait one second, Chef. Can I jump in here real quick? I, I I didn't catch all of what Herman said, but I, I'm going to give you an argument why you don't draft the quarterback at number three. Okay. Um, are we all in agreement that this is a, a must-win year for Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia, right? Absolutely. So, Sounds like it. We have, Certainly why, feels that we, way. why would anybody think that you would take a quarterback at number three that's going to sit behind a healthy Matthew Stafford? What when say to you have to look at it from their perspective. Yeah, They don't have the luxury of having three or four years left to build a team here. From my understanding, and I could be wrong, but my understanding is, is that they understand what's at stake here. They understand that it's, it's got to be pretty close to a, a playoff run. Mm-hmm. And so you're not going to get that. I don't care who the rookie quarterback is. With the 30 sec- 32nd ranked defense, you're not going to get a uh, a rookie quarterback to save money. The time is now, so that's why the the importance of who you pick now. And if you listen to to what Quinn was saying, you have to get a guy that's going to come in. He's going to play now. He's going to play from day one, and you probably do that with you know maybe your first couple picks. But for me, uh, to take a quarterback in the um, number three overall. It's insanity because these guys, if they do that, they're missing out on a player that they need to know that they can have help them win now. We know the goal is to win now. Yeah, let me, let me just jump in real quick on this one. But you, you may not have heard me. I actually didn't say that they should take a quarterback at three. No, 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 hold on. I, I didn't say they, as, a, as a wide receiver, I didn't say they should take a quarterback at three. I said if there's an opportunity to get one, I don't think they should take him at number three. I think they should go defense at number three. I, that's what I believe. I think they should get a defensive player, impact player, a day one starter with the third pick. I'm saying if there's an opportunity to get a quarterback uh, that could be one that you can bring along to mix in with some of that younger talent, I think they need to start looking at a quarterback, a young quarterback they can develop. All right, so Herman's going to believe that at some point you've got to address it, but not with the number three overall pick. Correct. But, but Dan, the, the impact of this class has to be immediate. Would you agree with that? And if so... How deep in the draft does the immediacy have to take place? 
No, I, I think it does have to be immediate because they have holes to fill. Um, and I think this, this, there's two prongs to this, Chef. You're exactly right. It has to be immediate. I think they're not drafted a quarterback in the first round. I don't believe either. So I think that that guy's got to play. I think your second round pick has got to play. You've got two third round picks where this, this draft presents depth that you should be able to bring in guys that, that, that have a role right away. But beyond that, let me let me say this, because we are kind of talking big picture here and Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia and having to keep their jobs and things like that. By far to me, the most important thing for this team is the core that they've built. And the guys have to come back better because that's what good teams do. It's not just winning in March and April. It's the guys that you already have. It's Tracy Walker. It's Will Harris. It's Deshaun Hand. It's Ragnow. It's, it's carry on Johnson. It's TJ Hawkinson. It's Kenny Galladay. All those guys have to continue to ascend. They have to get better. They have to be the core. These guys are going to be rookies whose heads are going to be spinning. I'd like to think they could come in and play right away and that they could come in and make an impact. But to me, got to get it right. But far more important is the guys that Bob Quinn has drafted over the past several years that have got to come back better and ready to lead this year. Why is it so difficult for quarterbacks and cornerbacks to transition from the collegiate level to the NFL level? Chris, let me ask you first on that. Uh, it's a big learning curve, and the speed of the game is tremendous. You look at, um, say, uh, a corner coming in, right? Say it's a corner from Michigan. Okay, he's out there guarding a guy from Bowling Green. And, then, and a guy from Bowling Green is not going to be – Garden a guy from the Green Bay Packers or Adam Thielen from the Vikings or Luke Hopkins or any of those type of guys or Herman Moore back in the day. So when you have those type of players, uh, there's a big learning curve. And so they can physically dominate guys at, at their level. Uh, they might face a guy of that capability at corner maybe once or twice a year but they're going to face uh, NFL wide receivers every single week. So that's the adjustment there. Also the nuances of playing receiver, uh, uh, how a receiver might sell like he's going to do something in his pre-snap read and he does something else. Learning the splits, understanding NFL route combinations, uh, understanding uh, how to read a defense. And is he on the same page? Is he seeing what the quarterback's seeing? Understanding that if he needs to run a route at 14 uh, if the receiver needs to run around at 14 yards, he's going to run it at 14 yards. So these are all the little, <clears throat> excuse me, things that corners need to learn. And had a great conversation with Mike Zimmer, head coach of the Vikings. And you guys know that Mike has uh, made his bones basically as a defensive back coach and considered a highly respected defensive back coach. And I asked him specifically about the cornerback position. And from his training and what he's learned over the years, is from the cornerback position that, that takes about a year or a year and a half to really get comfortable. The other thing about corners, uh, you can't have any any China doll mentals out there. You know, if the guy if the guy gets his feelings hurt or is 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 afraid to be the reason why they win or be the reason why they lose, you can't draft them. And so it's just a big, huge physical and mental adjustment to be able to play corner at a high level. Mm-hmm. And you have guys that can do it, like Richard Sherman. I think Richard probably runs um, maybe a 4-7 on his best day at this point in his career. But yeah. Richard understands every little nuance of playing that position, and that's why he's still a very uh, productive, valuable player for the 49ers. Norm, you agree with that? Bring in players who are in the right mental frame of mind. And I agree with Chris that they can't have a fragile personality – they have to be able to, you know, win. And when they things don't go right, because that ultimately will happen as a rookie, you have to be able to put those pieces back together. I know I struggled with that personally. My, my rookie year came in and after leading the, the, the nation and receiving and then didn't get off to the start that I needed, uh, I, I had to make, if I didn't have the confidence that I had, I, I think I would have been done in the NFL and it would have been tough to recover from that. But yeah. uh, I, I thought I came in ready to play, but at the same time, it is a big transition, but as I alluded to earlier, and I, I mentioned earlier, I think there's preparation that's being done a little differently now 
than what it was in the past to where when I was coming out. And Chris, I like how you said uh, Herman Moore back in the day, man. I, you know, put me back in the day. But yeah, so it, it's, it's something to be said for that. So I, I agree with what Chris is saying. Hey, TJ, at some point, this team's going to have to address its interior offensive line. Why aren't you guys valued as much as you should be? Well, not, you might have to address the tackle position, too. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, I mean, Taylor, Taylor Decker going into his fifth year. Um, don't know what's going to happen after that. You just lost your starting right side of the line with Rick Wagner and Graham Glasgow. Yeah. Um, look, I, I think offensive line is a tough position to judge because every year you kind of see these guys who are labeled at the top, maybe three, top five guys. And after the combine, they drop down to, you know, maybe 20, 25th range. And you're thinking – why, you know, watch the tape, watch the tape, tape with offensive linemen is, is the most important um, scouting tool that you can possibly use. Um, you look at guys like just a couple of years ago with Orlando Brown, you know, who was a big dude coming out of Oklahoma, ran a five, eight 40 at the combine, um, got drafted in the third round. And he, he looks like he's going to be an all pro type of player for, for his generation. So I, I think it's, it's a fine line with offensive line, line with offensive linemen uh, as far as scouting, um, the one thing you, you have to get, and, and I kind of look at it, my career, I look at it a lot like quarterbacks, where if they have a, an opportunity to sit behind um, an established veteran for maybe a year or two, that does a lot for their confidence, and it, it shows them a lot how to get better. Um, so I, I think, hey, if you go, if you can trade back and you can pick up an extra second rounder, maybe a third rounder, I would definitely be thinking about using one of those on an offensive lineman because it is a pretty deep class after the first maybe four or five tackles that are going to be taken in the first round. Um, there's a lot of guys who, you know, Cesar Ruiz from Michigan who can play center, looks like he can play guard. Same with uh, the kid out of LSU, Lloyd Cushenberry, um, was a very good player in the SEC yep. for, for a couple of years. So I, I think that if I'm – if I can pick up an extra pick in the second or third, I, I think it would be very, very smart to – um, think about addressing your offensive line. At, at, can I ask? Can at, I ask TJ latest? <laughs> can I ask TJ a question? Sure. Uh, yeah. TJ, I just I was curious because I know, like when I went came from Ohio State and then went in my first mini camp and I said all of a sudden saw these offensive linemen, all of a sudden everybody moves at such a great speed in sync. It just was that's the biggest difference I noticed in transition from college. To pro, maybe talk about. I think one of the reasons why it, the the technique to play at the offensive line is, I I think from an NFL perspective, if you make a technique mistake playing in the NFL on the offensive line, you're beat. It's over. It's done. If you make, and if you're a player like TJ, if you make a, a technique mistake at Eastern Michigan, his superior playing abilities, he can he can play through that technique and not get his rear end beat. But if you make – is this true, TJ? If you make a technique mistake on the offensive line in the NFL, it's over. Is that accurate? A hundred percent. And I think that was my biggest learning curve coming into the NFL was exactly what you said. I was able to use my strength and my speed at Eastern Michigan to win a lot of blocks. When I came into the NFL – I wasn't overpowering anybody, you know, That's I, crazy. Wasn't, I wasn't pancaking, um, you know, Aaron Campman, who was a defensive end in the Green Bay yeah. Packers. And I was there, Clayton. I wasn't, I wasn't muscling those guys around. So I had to learn really quick. I've got to get a lot better with my hands and with my footwork and to put myself in good, um, you know, knee bent position to, uh, to make sure I can, I can get the job done. And that's why it took me a little bit longer. I sat for my first two years. I was a sixth, seventh guy off the bench. And um, I, I was in a, a, a position to learn a lot from the veterans in front of me and, and knew really quick that, wow, I didn't really work on my technique a lot at, at Eastern Michigan because I didn't need to, you know, I was, I was bullying yeah. guys. I was manhandling guys, but it's different game now. And I'm, I'm definitely going to have to, if I want to make this team and I want to make a career out, you know, out, out of this, then I, I got to get a lot better with the technique. I think that's the one thing with the offensive linemen you look at coming out. How's their technique? Is it going to be a developmental guy? We're going to have to take a year or two to kind of teach him the ins and outs. Maybe it's a guy like Ben Barch from St. John's uh, Division Three school who played tight end for his first three years and uh, has got a lot of uh, ability, but he's only been playing offensive line for a year now. So that, that's every, that, those are definitely questions you have to take into account. Um, sure, the better technique guys, we see guys from Iowa and Wisconsin that can come out, usually have pretty good technique, good coaching in college. Um, that usually translates to the NFL a lot quicker than some of the smaller school guys or some of the bigger guys who just relied on 
strength and athleticism and power to win in college. 85th annual NFL draft taking place Thursday, 8 o'clock. And then on Friday, rounds two and three at seven o'clock. And then Saturday at noon, rounds four through seven. So 255 picks overall. Final question for you, gentlemen. Dan, we'll start with you. Um, perfect scenario. Detroit comes away from this coming weekend with what in their draft back pocket? I would like to see them come away with a with a cornerback. I think Okuda would be a terrific pick in the first round. If not him, I don't think you can go wrong really with Simmons or Derek Brown. But I think they need to address a corner at some point in this draft. They need to add some interior defensive line depth. I would like to see them add an edge rusher that can at least be a part-time player and figure out a way to get after the quarterback this year. Um, I, I think at some point they're going to add a running back. At some point they're going to add a wide receiver. It just depends on how the board falls and what they're looking at. And I would not be surprised if at some point during this draft, they draft a quarterback as well. They've got nine picks. I think they can address some significant needs with those first four picks, first round, second round, two in the third. And if they pick up another asset by moving back, I, I think they've got the opportunity here in this draft to do some very nice things. Herman, what would you like to see him do? Don't forget, they need a punter too now. Herman, what would you like to see him do? <laughs> uh, <laughs> punter. <laughs> um, you know, I would, I would like to – They need all of them, Jeff. You know, yeah, definitely go defense in the uh, the first round with the, the third pick unless they trade back. Uh, as Dan just mentioned, they got enough picks, I think, to make uh, some really smart moves to really improve the, the depth of this this roster and picking up at least, I would say, three ready to play players uh, that should be in that, those nine picks. So defense uh, early. I, I look for them also to when they start looking at the skill position. Now, if they can find a corner uh, with one of those first or second picks uh that would be great and then from there uh somewhere in those those uh those later rounds i think looking for a quarterback if it's there i'd take it but you know receiver i think they're good i think you can always find receivers uh mm -hmm. but if, if one just is there that you can't pass that's on you get them but uh, you need players you got people and they got to have some depth and ready uh to, to contribute to the team's effort TJ, what's hey, Herman, the hey, I got a quick question for Herman. When you were negotiating your contract, did you ever tell the GM you can always find a receiver? <laughs> no, but not, not, you can't find a number one, though. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a, hey, listen, hey, you, you, Chris already knew. Hey, it, it, Chris, Chris, I, I used to hate having to block Chris Spillman in practice because he didn't understand that I was a little guy and that he didn't have to go so hard all the time. And, you know, Chris, if anybody knows anything about him, he, he, he plays like in practice like it's a game. So... <laughs> So, <laughs> so Herman didn't like blocking Chris because Chris is constantly go, go, go. What's the win-win, Chris, for uh, for the Lions Thursday and this weekend? Well, just give me a quick refresher, Shep, because these guys are cutting in and out on what everybody said, so I, I don't repeat what everybody said. Well, that's okay. Whatever your opinion is. I mean, look, they, they, they've got plenty of needs as long as they address the, the cornerback spot, yeah. some edge rushing, some interior offense and defensive line. And then, uh, you know, I threw the punter in there as, as half-heartedly joking. But look, yes. I mean, special teams is the third of the game, fellas. It's an important part, and Sam Martin's gone. So you got to find someone. Uh, I never bought that BS that special teams is <laughs> third of the game. <laughs> find, some, find some gunners that can tackle. You don't need yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Oh, my gosh, Shep. Uh, what do you, you mean have Jim Arnold on the phone? Or? Jason, what are, what are you doing? So you guys, you guys already see what I had to deal with, man. Uh, yeah, I'm doing. I'm, you know, Eddie Murray joined us pretty soon. Yeah, Eddie. I don't yes. know if you knew that, but Eddie Murray, Jason Hanson, Jim Arnold. Yeah, Sam uh, coming back. Yeah, yeah. That, we that would be a, a breakdown of figure skating for yeah. the guys. So. Here comes Tom <laughs> the motion, yeah. Um, I look. You have to get. You know, I, I think. Be. I, I'm going to go back to the original point. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on these guys to win and win now. It's different than it was three years ago, right? This is It's time to win. So you can't make mistakes. So you need guys that are starters and guys that give you the best chance to have an impact player. You can't have a miss in your first round, second round. You can't have misses. Right. So the best case scenario for me is that uh, they get two and a half starters out of this draft. If you can get two and a half starters, then uh, – maybe four contributors that, I mean, like you said, I was just kidding about special teams and especially maybe a back backup interior defensive lineman. Cause those guys are on a rotational basis right. and uh, obviously any type of edge rusher, but 
they, they just need to get something and they need to get it in a hurry. And everybody understands the pressure's on. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with being having to win now. Yeah. That that focuses a team and gives them a sense of urgency. And I the running back position too. Yeah. Is, is, is something that needs to be addressed because as much as I love carry on Johnson, I think he is a special player, but you know, he, he hasn't been able to stay on the, on the field. And, you know, we were signing guys off the couch. Last year, hey, uh, you know, he's sitting down there watching uh, 90 Day Fiance the other way <laughs> on Wednesday night and Friday or Sunday afternoon is dressing for the game. <laughs> All right, run right, run left. Go get him, Bo. <laughs> DJ, what's the win-win in your mind? Uh, win-win. I actually just saw a report this morning. Ian Rappaport was saying that Washington was fielding calls for the two picks. So I think in a perfect world – Huh. Maybe uh, Miami jumps up to two, takes a quarterback, and who's sitting there for you at three but Chase Young? <laughs> I don't know how, how big of the chances that actually are, but you never know. And that's why yeah. if I'm the Detroit Lions, I don't make any tra- trades before uh, the draft starts Thursday because something can happen. Somebody could jump up to number two and throw a haul at Washington, and now you're in a whole different predicament than you thought you were c- yeah. coming into the draft. Um, one big thing I think, point. obviously, that uh, I'd like to – you know, I don't want to – piggyback on what everybody else is saying with the, the de- defensive needs. But if you look at this uh, wide receiver room in Detroit right now, a lot of good players, Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, Danny Amendola. Uh, none of those guys are signed through 2001. They're all going into contract years. Um, I, I think it's going to be tough to keep all three of those guys. If you have to keep one, I think Kenny Galladay is the obvious answer. But you're going to need, I think, a young guy to come in. Maybe if you if you get an extra pick in the second round, um, you really got to think about running back or wide receiver, a skill guy that can help you on the offense. That's going to be here for a couple of years because uh, the way it does look with, with, with uh, none of those guys being signed, signed long-term, yeah. you're probably going to lose one or two of those guys and you're going to have a hole either this year or next year. Um, if there's a guy you really love there in the second round, maybe a Justin Jefferson type guy falls down, maybe a T Higgins, big body from Clemson. Mm-hmm. Um, you really got to think about taking one of those guys to help your future as well. That's a great point. You guys are all active on social media, especially during these times. Uh, have you guys followed what Chris Spielman has done with his daughters and the very? <laughs> <laughs> what about the faceless helmet or, or the face mask helmet? Shit. Yeah, well, We're old school. Look at we we got some footage here. I don't, that's we know that's not you because you can't move like. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. You'll know it's Chris really quick. You see the stiff knees, the stiff hips. Yeah, <laughs> there's a masculine tiger helmet shot. <laughs> There's a throwback jersey from oh, 94 throwback. Nice. with a Zubaz. <laughs> this is my yeah. basketball player from Bowling Green, so she went all Bowling Green on him. She can dance. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say he has yeah. clothes going right there. Now, the star, oh. the star of the show is coming. <laughs> Look at those moves. Now, oh, hey, my hey, goodness. Hey, hey, Chris. DJ. Hey, Chris, man. That's DJ, embarrassing, you know, man. Herman knows me a little bit. You notice the weighted vest, right? Oh, boy. So you got to have the weighted vest on there. Look at so that knee bend. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Hey, some there you stiff go. hips. Hey, hey, hey Chris. <laughs> hey, all, all I remember is this. Chris oh, did it. <laughs> hey. Woo. I'm I glad you didn't have to hear you dance, dance a little better than that, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. Everything is response and attitude. Right? How we respond. And there it is, Chris. Is how you get through. There you go, Herman. Yeah. He never – Ali scored one touchdown. Herman scored all the touchdowns. <laughs> I know. I know yeah. this, Chris, right? <laughs> what other dad moves you're throwing out at us? Oh, <laughs> oh Chris, Chris, Chris. Sea rolls. <laughs> Great stuff. <laughs> Fellas, thanks for the insight. Thanks for the laughs. Always appreciate it and love your work. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Enjoy the draft this weekend. Thanks, right. Chef. Thank you. Thanks, Chef. Thank you.